Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for this presentation on glaucoma surgeries presented by Matt Schlenker in celebration of World Glaucoma Week 2022. My name is Suzanne, and I'm the administrator with Glaucoma Research Society of Canada. Tonight's webinar is the latest installment in our online lecture series called Demystifying Glaucoma. Previous topics we covered in this area, in this series, sorry, are uh, the importance of eye drops, which was presented by Dr. Rajiv Binlish for the World Glaucoma Week 2021, and visual field and OCT tests, which was presented by Dr. Catherine Burt in June of last year. Uh, recordings for all of our videos and webinars can be found on our website at www.glaucomaresearch.ca. We would like to thank you all for attending this evening, and we'd also like to thank uh, a special thanks to Abby and Allergan Company. They provided an unrestricted educational grant which helped us deliver this public event for free here this evening. So thank you very much, Abby. Just a reminder, during the live webinar, you can submit a question. Uh, there's a Q&A icon. It's usually located towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, Dr. Schlenker will be trying to answer your questions throughout the presentation this evening. So you can uh, send in your question anytime throughout the presentation and he should, he'll try and get to it right away. But if not, it might have to wait till the end of the presentation. First though, to introduce Dr. Schlenker is Glaucoma Specialist and Glaucoma Research Society board member, Dr. Rajiv Finlish. You may recognize him from uh, the iDrop webinar or from the Q&As in the biannual newsletter. So without further ado, I'll pass it along to Dr. Finlish. I hope you enjoy the rest of the time spent here with us this evening. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Suzanne, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, all our participants. It uh, looks like we have a record number attending tonight. Uh, welcome to our uh, third in a series of lectures uh, about glaucoma and uh, demystifying glaucoma. Uh, if you have any specific uh, topics you would like us to possibly cover, please don't hesitate to uh, let us know. Um, thank you again to Allergan uh, for their uh, educational grant uh, for uh, allowing us to present this uh, lecture. And uh, as Suzanne pointed out, this is World Glaucoma Week, and uh, this uh, event actually gets registered um, with uh, sort of a, a glaucoma society around the world uh, as an event to try and promote uh, the education of glaucoma. So uh, thank you to our supporters and to uh, all the other participants uh, participating. Uh, your generous support to uh, the Glaucoma Research Society of Canada certainly uh, helps us fund glaucoma research across Canada. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker to, uh, for tonight, uh, and that is Dr. Matt uh, Schlenker. Uh, Matt is probably one of the up-and-coming rising glaucoma specialists uh, in Canada, and uh, currently he's in practice uh, at the University of Toronto. He's at the Donald K. Johnson Eye Institute at the Toronto Western Hospital, and he's also at the Kensington Eye Institute. Uh, he's also associated with PRISM Eye Care in Mississauga. Matt uh, started out in economics and had an epiphany uh, that he wanted to do better for the world. So he decided to go back and uh, went to medical school and uh, completed medical school and his ophthalmology residency at the University of Toronto. He then did an advanced anterior segment and glaucoma fellowship with Dr. Ike Ahmed at the PRISM Eye Institute in um, Mississauga. Uh, he also holds a master's in epidemiology, uh, and that allows him to uh, present and publish wonderful articles about uh, glaucoma surgical success, as well as uh, other areas of glaucoma. And uh, he is a very uh, well attuned glaucoma specialist, very gifted hands, and can do a number of glaucoma procedures. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Matt Schlenker. And uh, thanks, Matt, for uh, participating tonight. Well, thank, thank you, Raj, for that introduction. That was uh, incredibly generous of you. Some of those things are true, as you said. 
And, and Suzanne, thank you for all your work organizing this. And what a great idea to do something like this during uh, World Glaucoma Week, where we're really trying to get it out there uh, more and more, the importance of staying top on top of this uh, disease. So thank, thank you, all of you, for the idea and supporting this. And it's fantastic to see the number of attendees. Uh, and I was just scrolling through the names, and there's definitely some familiar faces, uh, either previous patients or current patients. Uh, so th thank you for attending. Uh, of course, some of the things we're going to talk about may or may not be specific to your situation. This is going to kind of be a broad overview, if you will. Uh, with that said, if there are particular aspects that you're interested in, try to put them in the question and answer, and I will do my best, I would say, to, to answer. Uh, again, kind of trying to keep things broad, but at the same time, recognizing that not everything I'm going to speak about will relate to every particular situation. So I'm just going to put some slides up here. Hopefully I'm a co-moderator now. Okay, so the title I was given was Glaucoma Surgeries, an Overview, Different Types, and When It's Time. And that is what we are going to uh, try to focus on uh, for this. And I just want to list some of my disclosures. So I do work with some of the companies that makes some of our uh, either surgical devices or some of the things we use during surgery. And on the one hand, you may say, well, that, that introduces bias to what you're doing. And I think it can. And that's why we often do disclosures as part of our uh, presentations. I also think it's an opportunity and I have a lot of gratitude to these companies that they're willing to work in our space. And I think we need to support and guide and help these companies that want to work in our space because we want to do better. And we do need, uh, we need industry to help us. And I think we have come a long way on the medication side and also on the surgery side uh, because, of, because of these companies. And I also really am appreciative for the uh, Glaucoma Research Society and what it does. The research that has been produced, the community, I think is important as well uh, for peer support and also just mobilizing situations such as this where we're able to get together at night. I just want to highlight this is a research project that I was heavily involved in uh, that was recently published, and this was supported by many of you. Uh, this is a, some of you guys have, some of you who are patients have been on this medication before, Dimox, Recetazolamide, and then there's a cousin medication called Methazolamide or Neptazine. And this medication has feared complications that makes many clinicians, including myself, hesitant to prescribe sometimes. And it is not a perfect medication. There are side effects. The side effects, I would say, are th the, the main ones are ones that you can feel and experience. You kind of know what the enemy is, but they can be incredibly helpful for acute glaucoma situations and sometimes chronic. And we were able to do this research looking at 130,000 patients utilizing big data on Ontario to really profile the toxicity associated with this medication. And overall, it was, it was reassuring. And this has been, I'd like to think of value add. You can see on the right, a, a recent news report that was published on February 1st. And our formal publication is in JAMA, JAMA Ophthalmology. So thank you again for allowing us to do research like this. And it's really our day-to-day -day interactions with patients as well that spurs this type of research, such as, doctor, you're going to give me this medication, what can go wrong? And, and that's really what, what spurred this research. Okay, so let's move a little bit to the surgery side. And again, I'm going to present something at a fairly high level, three times where we should consider surgery. And of course, can it be more complicated than that? Well, yes, it is more complicated than that. And does it depend on your diagnosis? Yes, it does. But here are kind of three items that I wanted to highlight. Okay, the first one is probably the most familiar to us. This is a metric we focus on, the intraocular pressure, because as the eye pressure goes up, it can squeeze the optic nerve and we slowly can lose nerve cells, which lead to irreversible damage to our visual field. 
And by the end of the disease, we can lose our central vision, which can be very, very uh, debilitating. It can decrease our function. Okay. Now we have a lot of research. I was just, I was just at the American Glaucoma Society uh, conference. Uh, and this is kind of a old study now and been around for a long time, but it keeps on coming up. And the main takeaway here is if you look on the right, there's a little graph and there's one of the, one of the uh, lines is highlighted in green. And that green one is hovering around zero. And the zero on the y-axis indicates the amount of visual field deterioration. The difference between that green line and the three lines that are higher than that one is these patients always had a, very, a fairly good eye pressure, not necessarily a perfect pressure, and it was 17 or below. So every visit over 96 months, so we're talking a long, fairly long follow-up for a glaucoma study or trial, these patients had a reasonable eye pressure and their visual fields didn't change very much. On average, of course, unfortunately there are exceptions. And this was the impetus for what we call eye pressure targets. And you may have your doctor say this, I'd like your eye pressure within a certain range, or at least they may say, we don't know the exact range we want it, but we would like it lower. And I said, we have a fair amount of research going into this. Is this the only contributor to glaucoma damage? Unfortunately not. We focus on it because it's a significant contributor for many patients, and it's something that we can do something about. Okay, number two. So often, number one and number two go together, but not always. And that kind of depends on the situation and the glaucoma diagnosis itself. But when the glaucoma is getting worse, that's when we start to consider surgery. For instance, there are some patients where we will let their eye pressure run a little high for a variety of reasons. And one would be that they seem to be stable at that eye pressure. But of course, we're more concerned if we start to see deterioration. Now, what are some things that we would look at that would indicate, quote unquote, deterioration? Well, there's basically two, and I don't want you to get alarmed by the next slide because there's a lot going on. And these are the things we look at. If you're, a, say, a Dr. Binlish or a Dr. Trope, you've been looking at these for years. And you, it's not that you just glance at it, but you have a lot of pattern recognition uh, over the years, and you start to understand them. On the left side, are metrics that look at our optic nerve. And we look at the thickness of the nerve layers in the optic nerve. We can compare those thicknesses to a normative database. So a database of other patients with similar age. And then over time, we can actually compare the nerve layer to itself. And that's why patients get followed over time. And that's why sometimes we don't know the answer and the question and the answer is, come back another time and let's see how things go over time. So we kind of put this together and again, compare patients to themselves and also patients compared to other like patients to help us better understand. And this is also in the context of looking at your optic nerve uh, using our lenses in the clinic. On the right side, you see one of the examples of the analyses we do on the visual field. The visual field, for many of you is tedious and you probably dread it. And I've done the visual field myself and it can be painful because you're sitting there in this little you know, uh, circular dome, if you will. And there's this little light flashing and you really wanna do well and you start to get a little bored and maybe you're a little bit tired and this light keeps on going and you hear the sound and then you start worrying that you're not doing very well. And I recognize it can be very tedious and I give my patients a lot of credit for going through that every, you know, so often. But what it does is really delineate how much of your vision you have. And here again, we can compare to other people who are in a similar situation as you, and we can also compare to yourself. And those give us trends over time or events where we see focal damage. And we put this together to help us understand whether it's time to escalate your therapy, which we will get to here in a sec. So this is maybe a good time to just address one of the questions that have, that have come up. And one of, one of you out there just said that the optic nerve in one of the eyes is damaged at about 80%. And the doctor feels may need an, an operation if it progresses. 
and then just asking for risk factors and percentages. And again, this is where it's tricky. I'm going to focus on the risk factors just because there's a lot that we can control. One of which is the one we just discussed, which is the eye pressure. So if people have a lot of damage, but their eye pressure was high, and now we've done something to lower it, well, then we're more likely to wait and start to look for these trends over time. If the eye pressure continues to be high, that will be a different story. We may not want to wait for trends over time. We may know that it's inevitable. Another thing that if you've been put on medications for your glaucoma, I can tell you that they only work if you take them. And the worst case scenario in a glaucoma situation is you take them the day before you come see your eye doctor and your eye pressure is okay that day and the eye doctor is false reassured. And then we have to wait for trends or events over time when really the writing's on the wall because the eye pressure is not controlled for those days that you are unable or forget to take your medication. And this is just to uh, kind of hit home how bad this disease can be. You're going to see those kind of black areas in the top. And this is an unfortunate uh, situation where this patient is basically looking through tunnel vision. And remarkably, many patients, especially when it happens in both eyes, do not notice this because it's kind of like a, you know, a frog. If you put them in the hot water and it slowly, slowly warms up until it's too hot for the frog, it's, just, it's the same type of situation for glaucoma. And sometimes I relate this to kind of like you're looking through a little bit of a straw at this point, again, tunnel vision. And this is a difficult situation because it's very hard to track glaucoma progress at this time. And it's also hard because the stakes are high when we do any intervention because the eye has become quite fragile at this point. And this just hits home the importance of making sure that we screen and, and recognize glaucoma early before it gets to this stage. But unfortunately, despite our you know, universal healthcare system, this is the type of situation I see on a day-to-day -day basis. The third time when we're going to consider glaucoma surgery is when we're going into the eye to do surgery anyway. And the most common time that people will encounter ophthalmology surgery or eye surgery is cataracts. I describe cataracts kind of like wrinkles. They're inevitable, but the time course in terms of when we get them and how, how quickly they progress is variable. What are some of the symptoms of cataracts? Well, this picture on the right is kind of a depiction and everyone experiences cataracts a little bit differently. But some of the common side effects that people will get from cataracts is feeling like things are not as clear. So if they're trying to read street signs, for instance, or even trying to read a book, things just may not seem as clear. Colors may also be washed out and they may get more glare, particularly lights. So a classic situ situation is when people are driving and they have incoming, oncoming traffic and the lights, and they will describe kind of flares coming off the light or halos coming across the light. So if you're getting those types of symptoms, it could be that you're starting to get cataracts. If those symptoms are really fluctuating in nature, it's more likely that you could be getting something called dry eye, which is when the very surface of your eye, your cornea, has irregular spots and is dried out, particularly if your symptoms are associated with a foreign body sensation or gravel or like, like there's something in your eye. If that's the case, it may not be cataracts yet. It may just be dry eye, which I shouldn't necessarily say just because it can be incredibly bothersome, but you may benefit from something like dry eye treatment as opposed to going ahead for cataract surgery. But let's say you do get to the point where those cataracts are really bad and it's time for them to be addressed. It's kind of like you need to seize the moment. If you're going in there for surgery anyway, why not consider glaucoma management at the same time? The lowest form of which would be, let's say your glaucoma is perfectly stable, uh, not unlike uh, you know, one of the questions that came up, but you're having cataract surgery anyway, we may consider a small glaucoma surgery for that type of situation for instance, even to try to reduce the medication load. So if you look at this uh, patient, you may say to yourself, oh, surely the eye on your left is the one that had surgery. But actually the one in the left is the one that's taking the medications. And the one on the right is the one that had surgery. And this patient is obviously much happier with the uh, right eye because they're not taking the medications, the bother of taking it on a day-to-day -day basis. 
uh, but also you can see that there's a lot less redness and irritation uh, for the eye. And that, that just touches on another question that's come up, you know, this question of whether you use medications or not. And generally speaking, the unfortunate reality is that medications are a mainstay of glaucoma treatment. They're often a lifelong treatment. But because we have some of these newer, reasonably safe alternatives as adjuncts to glaucoma surgery, we sometimes try them. And that's why, for instance, your ophthalmologist may be talking to you about that, that possibility. There's also lasers that can be considered instead of uh, medications. And again, the benefit of those lasers are that you don't have to take an agent in your eye on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's more and more evidence over time, high-level evidence, randomized control trials, multi-center, that are showing the benefits of these lasers. So I would take it seriously if your doctor feels you may be a candidate for some of these laser therapies. Okay, so let's say that one, two, or three of the reasons I just gave are, to, are deemed, you know, making it sound like it's time to go ahead with surgery. Well, what now? So, you know, Dr. Trope told me a number of years ago, he, he was telling me about the days where they really only had one glaucoma surgery. And that glau glaucoma surgery was a trabeculectomy. Okay, and we still use a trabeculectomy in the right situation to this day. But things have become complicated. Uh, my surgical coordinator has told me we, do, we, we, we do more than 15 glaucoma surgeries now, and it can get very complicated for the patient. And I feel like many of the patients come in overwhelmed. They've maybe consulted Dr. Google, or they've had a preliminary conversation with their referring physician and are overcome by all the different options. And admittedly, I think it is challenging. I think one of our new challenges is not the number of surgeries we have or the, the, the uh, uh, options necessarily, but it is figuring out which option is best for which patient. So let me try to unravel some of that yarn if possible. This is just a, a, a short schematic to illustrate the trade-off. There's no free lunch, unfortunately, in the glaucoma treatment spectrum. Everything is about risk and benefit. And you can imagine the things that work best have the most risk, whereas the things that don't work as well, well, they have a little bit less risk. So on the bottom left is the least risky of our options, which is maybe using one medication, maybe using one medication at night, or maybe you're gonna do one of these lasers I referred to. Then you may start to escalate your therapy, and then on the top right is our traditional surgeries. Included there is the one called a trabeculectomy, where we make a little flap in the white part of your eye as a little bit of a safety valve to allow fluid to egress out of the eye when the eye pressure is too high. And then we have some other ways uh, to do that. Okay, so the eyes are closed here because I'm not sure everyone wants to see the next part. The next part is a surgical video, and it's an invasive surgical video. It's the kind of thing that not everyone is going to want to see. So if you don't like the idea of seeing fairly invasive glaucoma surgery in action, I recommend you close your eyes or take your head away from your screen right now. And I'm going to do this a few times. This video, I would say, is probably the worst of all of them, but I will again warn if anyone does not want to. And I know there was at least one patient who brought that up as a potential issue in this presentation, which I am sensitive to. So without further ado, I am going to, I am going to go ahead, please turn your head away if you're not interested in this and you can just hear what I have to say. So this is again, kind of the end stage. This is, we don't really want glaucoma to get to this stage. I'm just going to jump ahead. This is a gentleman who is in a bit of a tough situation and had a lot of follow-up and was basically blind in both eyes. So we're doing our best uh, for him given the situation. I'm just gonna skip here ahead a little bit to, so I'm just gonna pause. So on the right side, so this is, this is looking at the eye while a patient is laying down and we're currently taking out a fairly dense cataract. On the top right here, you can see that there's two holes in the iris. So this is a brown iris. This is the colored part of our eye. And there's two holes, and those represent previous trabeculectomies. So this gentleman basically had a trabeculectomy. 
we made that little safety valve flap uh, that scarred down and then had another one. And there was probably some revisions along the way trying to get those to work. And unfortunately, despite those reasonably large surgeries, the scarring was too much. When you make any type of cut in our body, our body likes to heal over. And despite using anti-scarring medications, which have revolutionized glaucoma surgery, but still not made it perfect, this gentleman's surgery scarred down. And we were left with a difficult situation where we basically lost that top real estate due to the significant scarring. So we ended up jumping to a different uh, invasive surgery where we put a silicone tube into the eye. I'll just skip ahead here to where we start to see the silicone tube. And we had to put it on the bottom part of the eye, uh, basically. And I said, I know there's some patients in the audience who've also had this, unfortunately, as well. So here we are opening up the uh, saran wrap part of the eye called the conjunctiva, and there's a little tissue called tenons under it. And then we're measuring, we try to go about 10 millimeters back and we put in a little suture, and this is gonna hold down a plate. You could call it maybe a reservoir. It's a silicone reservoir uh, that is supposed to kind of allow the fluid to egress into the veins and possibly the lymphatic system of the eye. And you're gonna see here, I'll just jump ahead. You can see what this tube looks like. And there that tube is. The patient themselves are not gonna see this tube because we hide it under the saran wrap part of the eye and it is ultimately hid under the lid. But this can be a very helpful surgery for people who are prone to scarring, who have not done well with our other surgeries or if we deem our other surgeries are too risky. This here is a silicone tube that has a three millimeter lumen. And we are just making a little insertion and we're gonna put that into the front of the eye so that that tube can drain fluid into this large plate back here and help uh, with the glaucoma. Okay, so if you did not find that invasive, uh, I would be a little bit surprised. I, I still find it invasive, even though I do it on a weekly basis. What we've tried to do over time is find surgeries that are maybe not as invasive. And you can see here on my little risk benefit graph, I, I put up a little something called the void where we felt over time that we kind of had our, our lasers, our medications, and then we had to jump to these much riskier uh, situations. And we've been working more and more in this space to fill this void where we have things that, again, they may, may, may not work as perfectly as the other ones, but the risk profile is much better. And I'm gonna share some of those with you. Okay, so in our risk benefit schema here, I'm circled these two anatomical approaches to surgery. The first one is subconjunctival filtering, which is just what I showed you, which is either a flap or putting a tube into the eye. The other one is using this space this kind of special space in the eye uh, in, in between two layers that has a lot of promise that unfortunately we don't have a current device. And I labeled these two anatomical approaches creating a new plumbing system. So our eye has a little drainage system and we have to abandon that one because it's not working very well and create an entire new plumbing system. And as I said, instead of using the flap surgery called the trabeculectomy, or that large silicone tube that I just showed you, we're trying to use micro stents and micro shunts to make that new uh, plumbing system. And again, these are uh, theoretically less risky and sometimes they can achieve similar results as some of our bigger surgeries in the right situation. Okay, so these are the eyes, the cue to be a little bit, little bit uh, uh, careful looking at the screen. If, Eye surgery is not for you. So we have uh, fellows and residents who we train. Our fellows come from all around the world. We have one this year from Portugal, one this year from Switzerland, and one from the U United States that have come uh, to uh, work with us and learn these various surgeries. And I sometimes joke uh, with them that they come here wanting to be archers. They want to be precise, slick surgeons. And unfortunately, I say we're sometimes more like plumbers still than archers, though we're trying to be archers more over time. And this is an example of a little bit more of an archer surgery called a Zen micro stent. And I'm just gonna skip through to the meat of it, 
which is basically, we're gonna go from inside the eye and we're gonna use a little injector to inject a micro stent, which is six millimeters long and has a 45 micron lumen. So tiny, tiny, tiny. And this allows the eye uh, fluid as it comes out to the eye to be flow restricted. Cause basically there's only a finite amount of eye fluid that can go through this little tube. And instead of doing all of that dissection that we did and put in all those sutures, we're able to, as I said, kind of be a little bit of an archer and use a gonial prism here, landmark exactly where we want to go. And with this injector, here we are tunneling through the white part of the eye and coming out just under the saran wrap. Again, you gotta be really precise here. You don't wanna go through the saran wrap uh, when doing this. So it does take a lot of training in a wet lab setting uh, before you're gonna uh, do this. And a lot of thinking goes into how best to do this. <clears throat> and basically now we're delivering a little yellow, it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but you may see a little yellow tube that is coming out. And then we got a little blood, which sometimes happens. We're gonna move that blood away here in a sec and it should be more evident that little tube. And that little tube is kind of a minimally invasive. Think of, think of the difference between open heart surgery and cardiac stents. That's kind of what's happening here. And that little tube, we like it to be nice and mobile, free of scar tissue to allow fluid to drain. And we, when we feel like this is a good approach, we love doing this surgery. And the patients too, I've been part of research projects, lead projects now, uh, indicating that the patient experience postoperatively is much better after this than some of our other surgeries. I alluded to this other special space that we continue to do research on where we're hoping at some point in the future we can utilize it to drain fluid from the eye. Unfortunately, we do not have a commercial uh, uh, option at this point. I think one of the most promising ones is on the top left called the iStar, which is a very, which a very uh, biodegradable material that we're hoping to put into this space that can hopefully act like a little bit of a wick and a sponge to drain the fluid. So hopefully that's something that can be in the horizon. And this will be particularly helpful for patients who are high risk or patients who are prone to scarring. This is just a little bit more schematics of that, which I'm not gonna go into great detail about. Okay, and someone asked a question here about these, you know, being a squeamish patient and whether someone is conscious doing these surgeries. And the answer is, I would say I do 95% of my surgeries under what's called conscious sedation, which means you get an intra, intravenous uh, catheter and it injects some relaxing medication and some pain medication. And I'm sure there's someone out there who feels otherwise, but I'd like to think by and large, uh, people's pain can be controlled uh, during, during the surgery. And if they are starting to get discomfort and pain, then we can give them uh, more medications. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears. And this is, uh, this is a situation where we feel like we don't have to abandon the existing plumbing system, but instead we're gonna try to augment. We're gonna try to enhance the normal physiological outflow from the eye. So we're basically gonna revise the current plumbing system. So how are we gonna do that? Well, there's lots of fun ways. And this is actually a term that was coined by a doctor, an Ontario doctor uh, named Dr. Ike Ahmed. And he works at Credit Valley Hospital, uh, continues to work there. And this is microinvasive glaucoma surgery. So what meets class classification of microinvasive glaucoma surgery? Well, you want to have micro incisions, not big incisions. You don't want to have a lot of trauma to the eye. They need to, they need to do something, it needs to be studied. They need to be very safe. And the patients need to have a rapid recovery. It's not uncommon for us as glaucoma specialists for a patient to come in and say, oh yeah, I'm really looking forward to eye surgery. I had my friend, my neighbor, they had eye surgery. They're very happy. And, and I say, wait a second, did your friend have cataract surgery? Oh yeah, they had cataract surgery. And I say, well, cataract surgery is a little bit different than what you've been sent to me for. And I, make, I try to make sure that that's clear that they're not necessarily going for cataract surgery, which really meets these criteria to a T. The good news is, especially for patients whose glaucoma is reasonably well controlled or the safety profile or the risks are too high for the other surgeries, we do have options now. And this is kind of that concept of being more minimalist. 
if you're a fan of this kind of way of thinking. The minimalist thinking I do in my clinic is, do I feel like this is, some, this is worthwhile to try, knowing that we may need to do more? And the word for that I use is stepwise. So I want to make sure that the patient understands that we may not get away with this, but if we're doing cataract surgery anyway, let's try this as a bonus to try to avoid future medications or future more invasive glaucoma surgeries. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, there's this little filter paper in the eye that drains the fluid. And that filter paper can get plug plugged and not work as well anymore. So we have some options in trying to get that plumbing system going. We can stent open that drainage system. We can cut open that drainage system, or we can dilate that drainage system. So I'm going to give you some examples. Okay. So these are two of the, I would say, these are, these are some of the reasons why I went into glaucoma when I was in my training. These are, the one on the right is the smallest stent used in the human body. Okay. And this thing is tiny and it needs a special injector and you have to be very precise in its placement. But we basically put, this was the original generation, a little snorkel into the drainage system to stent it open. Said kind of, it's kind of analogous to the cardiac stenting where people are stenting open uh, arteries or cardiologists are doing that. And then this one on the left is a newer micro stent, which has more and more uh, evidence. In fact, their most recent study that they did that was just presented at the American Glaucoma Society looked at visual field loss. And there was almost a 50% reduction in visual field loss in the patients who received this micro stent versus the patients who did not in their five-year randomized control trial. So some really nice data uh, coming in this MIGS microinvasive uh, space. Okay, so if you didn't have to close your eyes for the other ones, you definitely don't have to close your eyes for these ones. Uh, but if you are a little bit squeamish, uh, time to look away from the screen. This is just a video showing the hydrus microstent, which is a scaffold microstent that goes about three clock hours in the eye. There's a little injector and that injector is placed against that filter paper. That filter paper here is this little bit of a pigmented spot. And the pigment in this patient's uh, drainage system is a little bit variable, which we see. And so here's that little micro stent being injected through the tissue paper, if you will, and into the drainage system, which is called Schlem's canal. And someone asked a very good question. Can you have glaucoma surgery after cataract surgery? And the answer is very much yes. Probably about half the patients that I do glaucoma surgery have already had cataract surgery. These types of surgeries that I'm showing right now, the microinvasive, I think work best as bonuses or adjuncts to cataract surgery. So it's very rare that I would do this surgery after someone's had cataract surgery. I'm usually more in the realm of some of the bigger surgeries that I showed earlier. This one again is kind of a, think of the, the, the minimalist approach, stepwise approach, doesn't add a lot of risk to cataract surgery and doesn't add a lot of healing or recovery uh, to cataract surgery with the hope of avoiding bigger, more invasive surgery in the future. The other thing to point out is sometimes those bigger surgeries that I, I showed do not mix well. The effectiveness is not as good when you combine them with cataract surgery, whereas these smaller surgeries are synergistic with cataract surgery. So this one here is just a schematic that one of the companies has made. Instead of stenting open the, the, that little mesh paper you see there, you can use a blade. And this one is called the Hook Dual Blade. Malika Hook is a glaucoma specialist uh, in Colorado who worked on the design for this. And there's two blades that you can see there that are actually cutting out the, uh, that filter paper. And it's allowing the canal where the fluid is supposed to connect or, or collect to be open to the inside of the eye and allow, allow fluid to drain more readily. Now, Sometimes cost can be an issue with all these devices. And this is a technique that I do often, not necessarily because it's uh, cost effective, because I also believe in it and have good results. And what I can do is I use this suture up here. The very first time I did this, which is a number of years ago now, I had to go to the orthopedic room. 
And the orthopedic room had a little bit bigger sutures that I'm used to using, such as that 5-0 proline there. So I grabbed some of that and I was able to procure some of these uh, prisms that allow me to bend the light such that I could see the drainage system. And I grabbed some of the, don't tell the retina specialist, but I grabbed some of their instruments, their fine micro instruments. And I started doing these uh, less invasive uh, surgeries. And not only are they cost effective, but I find that they can work very well in the right, right situation. So this is just more of a proof of concept. This is, we won, a, won an award for this a few years ago at a conference because we we're actually able to map out the drainage system in the eye. And I'm just gonna skip to the uh, gist of it where we used a blue stain when we went in to the drainage system and we actually pushed some fluid. So there's a little catheter, you can see that red light. We use that catheter to go into the drainage system and we push some jelly into the drainage system and that jelly was stained with blue. And what you're gonna see here soon, if you look to the left, you're gonna see that there's a lot of blue and that's literally this jelly that we are pushing in going into their episcleral venous system. So we were able to show in vivo, intraoperatively flow enhanced flow, hopefully, uh, coming through this venous system by our minimally invasive uh, surgery. This is Matt. Okay, so I'm going to pause there. And I've just given, I had a few more videos there of kind of on the microinvasive, but I, th I think we're, you know, we've spent a lot of time. Uh, you know, just to summarize, there's three main reasons that you're gonna be considering, you and your physician are gonna be considering glaucoma surgery. One is that your eye pressure is too high and or your glaucoma is getting worse and or it's time for cataract surgery. For the glaucoma surgeries, I would, I would think of them in two big buckets. You're either gonna make a new drainage system or you're gonna to try to enhance your existing drainage system. And then for better or for worse, within each of those two buckets, there's this risk, tra risk benefit trade-off that depending on your specific situation, uh, you'll have to, you know, you and your physician will figure out kind of the best course of action for you. The good news is many of our patients do do well with glaucoma surgery. I did show you some situations where people end up getting more than one, but many patients, they get one glaucoma surgery, their situation is stabilized and they're able to continue forward. Most patients do not go blind from glaucoma in Canada in 2022 with appropriate follow-up and making sure that they take their medication. And this is much different than many parts of the world where there's not glaucoma care, not glaucoma treatment, and, and not glaucoma uh, surgeries. So I'm very grateful, again, for uh, the uh, physicians, the science behind much of what we've done. I'm so grateful for supporters that have supported that science. And I enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis the challenge of trying to work with patients uh, through their glaucoma. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Matt. Um, I think there are some questions in the question and answer. Um, if you want to kind of look at sure. a few of them and go from there. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give another question here. Or another question that come, came up is the, uh, someone just said that they're, they've at, been asked by their physician to press on their eye, okay? Now, the reason they've potentially been asked to press on their eye is because they have a new plumbing system installed in their eye. So that would either be the flap surgery or one of the micro stents or micro shunts and possibly even one of the larger, that silicone tube I showed. And sometimes we can kind of flush these new plumbing systems by pushing on the eye. This is not a indefinite long-term solution, but it can be both diagnostic to better troubleshoot why the eye pressure is creeping up and sometimes therapeutic, not unlike someone would flush a uh, plumbing system. So that's probably what's going on in this situation that there's been kind of a period of time where massage, we call it massage, which is a little bit of a euphemism for pushing on your eye, unfortunately, to try to get that new plumbing system working. 
Um, there was a, a question about uh, stem cell um, revitalization of the optic nerve. And uh, just, just to answer that question, uh, no, there is, uh, there is research in there, but there's nothing that's uh, live and, and, and mainstream. Um, it will be many years uh, before that will ever come to uh, fruition. And the reason being is it's not just a matter of injecting the stem cells, it's getting the connection of those stem cells to the proper area in the brain so that they function to uh, preserve the optic nerve. So that will take some time, but there is some research in that area. Yes, thank you. Another, another question that came up is about medications and someone asked about if they are late for taking one of their medications. So let's say you're two hours late. Now, the medications that we use nowadays are mostly twice a day and some are once a day. And there are still a few that are three times a day. And the goal is to space those drops out and to take them in a consistent fashion. Okay. So if you take a drop that's twice a day, you do want to take it every 12 hours. And the reason for that is you want not only a good eye pressure, but you want a stable eye pressure. There are some studies that indicate even eye pressure fluctuation can be deleterious to your optic nerve. Okay. So if you are late by two hours, I would still recommend that you take it. But the goal, and I think a lot of people I'm seeing more and more, are just setting alarms on their phone to go off to take their medications. And I think that's an excellent idea. I highly recommend it. Put an alarm on your phone and make sure it's a real annoying sound that goes off that reminds you to take your medications. Another question came up is about tearing in the eye. And I'm just going to address that. I think the question came up post-surgical, but I just want to address it generally. It's a, little bit of, it's a little bit confusing when someone's eye is tearing and they go to their eye doctor and their eye doctor will also often say that the eye is dry. And the patient says, no, doctor, you didn't listen to me. My eye is not dry. It is literally tearing. Tears are, are all over the place. I can't see through my tears. And what the, what the doctor means by that is when the eye is dry, so when the surface is irregular, it signals to our body to start making more tears. Unfortunately, when the eye, when the body is in overdrive and making tears like that, they are not the kind of tears that stick onto the surface very well. They are runny tears, they are watery tears. So they do not fix the problem. And then the eye, body continues to make tears. So until the underlying problem is addressed, you will continue to get tears. So why can you get that? Well, the eye can be dry. After surgery, it is very common that patients complain about a lot of tearing, and that is because you just had new incisions in the eye. Another unfortunate uh, reason why people have tearing is the drops that we have prescribed are irritating to the eye. That can be the actual medication agent itself, or it can be the preservatives that come with that drop, and that can lead to tearing as well. And yes, there is a small chance that there is a suture left in someone's eye after surgery, which can cause tearing. Uh, though nowadays, a lot of our surgeries do not have sutures, or if they do have sutures, they're dissolvable. So don't get me wrong, that can happen. But the lion's share of tearing is associated with dry and irritative symptoms of the surface of the eye and the eyelids. Okay, so there's a, there's a question about uh, prior retinal detachment uh, and that affecting some of the glaucoma surgeries. Um, what do you think about that, Matt? Sure. So I think there's, you know, it kind of depends on what the uh, situation is. I'm going to say two things about retinal surgery. First off, significant retinal surgery or significant retinal detachment that requires extensive labor or a uh, laser, sorry, can unfortunately make it difficult to diagnose and follow glaucoma because these types of situations can also affect the visual field. They're one of many other things that can cause the visual, visual field to be problematic. The other problem is, unfortunately, they can be associated with glaucoma, depending on the situation and the type of management that was needed. So they do go together. What are the implications for someone for glaucoma surgery? Well, unfortunately, it does make the glaucoma surgery a little bit harder, particularly if that patient uh, needed retinal surgery, because there's going to be some residual scarring. 
And that does sometimes push me a little bit more in favor of trying the minimally invasive techniques when I feel like I can get away with them. Unfortunately, in some of these situations, it's very clear that you're not going to get away with the minimally invasive techniques. So we go to the uh, larger surgeries that I showed uh, at, the, at the beginning. Okay, thanks for that, Matt. Um, I'll quickly answer this question about lutein supplements and glaucoma. Uh, no, lutein does not, is not directed toward glaucoma. It's directed toward macular uh, degeneration. So, um, uh, you mean people who take lutein supplements is to prevent or treat uh, macular degeneration. So, uh, not for glaucoma, but many people still take it. It won't, it won't harm you if you do. Um, so the, another question that actually came up in the chat was, um, uh, so it was just, um, okay, hang on a sec here. Let me just give you this one. How long can a trabecula trabeculectomy flap continue functioning? Uh, this gentleman had it uh, about 18 years ago. Um, and so he's just curious as to how long it'll last for. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Raj, you should be answering that one. <laughs> so it, it all depends. I mean, some people it, it can last uh, for a lifetime. Some people after a few years, it can stop working. And, and it just depends on the individual person, their ability to wound heal. Uh, but it's certainly quite possible to last a lifetime for some patients. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I remember it's been a few years ago now when I was a resident a fairly junior resident, had had a lot of exposure to glaucoma and one of our most senior glaucoma docs in the city. It's a doctor of not many words and it's probably the most excited I've ever seen that, that doctor. And we were, we were behind in a clinic and he called me over and he said, I want you to see this patient. And he showed me a situation where someone had that tunnel vision that I was showing before. And that patient had had it for some 15 years. And he'd had a, and this patient had had a surgery 15 years ago and it was a trabeculectomy and it continued to work. And I don't think I fully understood then at a very junior level of my training of the significance of that, that he was, that this surgery presumably was able to save what little vision this patient had left. And 15 years later, it still looked fantastic. I wish that that was always the reality. Uh, I think that the term here, lifetime guarantee uh, if someone gives you a lifetime guarantee on glaucoma, there was probably a miscommunication somewhere. Anyone who does glaucoma surgery, it's back to that concept of if you have an, if you have a cut in your body, what does your body want to do to it? And even if you are 90 years old, your body wants to heal that cut. It may heal it slower or differently than someone who's much younger, but at the end of the day, there's always that ongoing risk that the body will heal over whatever shunting procedure uh, we have done. And that is, that is the battle, that is the trenches of glaucoma, both for the physician and for the patient. Yeah, well said. Um, you mean, Dr. Trope uh, is an expert in this area. And uh, one day we may ask him to, to give his perspective on this. Um, just this question came up both in the chat and the Q&A. So what surgery is appropriate for open angle glaucoma with normal pressure and risks? And what is prognosis for open angle with normal pressure? And what are some alternatives uh, for treatment? Yeah, so this, this is, this is a, a difficult situation. Much of what I was sharing is that we focus on the risks that we can modulate. And that the biggest one is the the eye pressure. And we, I said, we have medications, we have laser, we have surgery. And this question pertains to patients who don't necessarily have a high eye pressure. So my first question is, are we sure that this patient does not sometimes have an eye pressure that is high? You've maybe been asked by your doctor to stick around clinic all day, or maybe you've been asked to go to your optometrist and get a lot of readings and not just come in the morning, but sometimes come in the afternoon. And you may be surprised, many patients have significant fluctuations in their eye pressure. And of course, that's a different ball game. So let's assume that it's really the case that the eye pressure, it's been proven that it is always low. When we do glaucoma surgery in those settings, there's two different goals. One is to just stabilize what they currently have and not necessarily 
try to go for a lower eye pressure. And those are, that's particularly when someone's going for cataract surgery, you might say, well, this patient has significant glaucoma. We don't think the, it's worth the risk to go through a big surgery, but let's just try to stabilize what they have. Not again, not necessarily trying to get a lower pressure. However, we also have significant evidence for the right situation where even if a person's pressure is low, we know that from a proof of concept standpoint, at least, if we can get it lower in a safe way, that it is better for that patient in the long term. So we do have situations where let's say a pressure is 14 and we try to get it to 10. Now to do that, usually we do have to go to the larger surgeries. It's unlikely that a microinvasive glaucoma surgery is going to get you there for strong physiological reasons. And I think we all, we also have uh, clinical evidence for that. And that's because of something called the episclerovenous pressure, which basically you can't get lower than by doing a, uh, a fixing of the existing plumbing system, if you will. So if it's very clear that someone is getting much worse with low pressure glaucoma or normal tension glaucoma, we sometimes consider doing the large, larger surgeries. But unfortunately, it is a difficult uh, disease to treat. I will say we have a randomized control trial in this where they followed half the patients without any treatment, and many of them did not lose vision over time. So I do not tell people that this is a, you know, a very poor prognosis disease. It's often a slow progressive disease. And I do think it's worth watching at least at the beginning in most situations. So uh, this question always comes up uh, and it's the use of uh, cannabis in glaucoma management. And I've always stressed that at the present time, uh, cannabis um, is not recommended for the treatment of glaucoma. Um, and uh, basically you'd have to ingest uh, a fairly consistent amount of it on a regular basis for pressure lowering. And that's not safe for your health. Um, if you smoke it, uh, it's will give you a high risk of lung cancer. And uh, as the terminology is, you would be constantly stoned. So you would not be able to drive function uh, and all that kind of stuff. So at the present time, cannabis is not meant for glaucoma treatment. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, so I'll go through, I can go through some of these other questions. I know we're... Uh, maybe yeah, two Two minute so warning. there was a question about uh, fluid bags under the eyes indicate anything about eye drainage? And the answer is no. The eye drainage that I've been talking about is the internal drainage of the eye. It does not have anything to do with the outside tearing or the associated lid problems that people can, can, uh, can get. I'm only talking about the internal production of fluid, which is called aqueous or aqueous humor and it draining through the internal plumbing system, which is this fluid, this filter paper I've been talking to called the Trebekler meshwork. Uh, another one, you know, was just asked again, this concept of using uh, cataract surgery as an opportunity to uh, stop eye drops. And yeah, in the right situation, I do offer a surgery that is, has the right wrist balance to, possibly stop the, 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 uh, the glaucoma medications uh, post-operatively. And again, that just depends on the situation. It's not a lifetime guarantee, but I do think it's a great opportunity to try to help out with glaucoma when the time comes for cataract surgery. Uh, there, was a, there was a question about does stress affect eye pressure? And I think this has been studied fairly extensively. Uh, unlike say something like blood pressure, which does seem to correlate quite well with stress, the eye pressure does not seem to. The only exception to that is Valsalva maneuvers. Okay, so things like, and actually Dr. Trope has done a lot of research on this, things like playing a trumpet, or maybe if you do a lot of uh, Pilates that has kind of uh, positions that are causing a lot of stress, uh, goggles theoretically, this uh, tie that I'm sporting right now, these all may have a modest uh, modulation in our eye pressure. Uh, you know, the good news is they're hopefully modest, uh, most of them, but there could be situations, especially with people with advanced glaucoma, where, especially if they do something a lot, that 
that these could be taken into consideration for the uh, treatment. There was a question about wearing a warm mask. I would say that this can really help to decrease the inflammation around the lids. And there can be, there's, there's a lot of uh, gland excretions around the lids. And by using warm, warm towels or warm compresses, or you can buy these little uh, uh, you know, really gel nice. packs to put over your eyes, yeah. those can really help uh, with the dryness and irritative symptoms and maybe make your glaucoma drops not sting as much as well. Okay, Matt, I have to cut you off here. It's eight o'clock. And uh, so this uh, draws uh, to an end our, uh, our webinar on glaucoma surgery. Uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, presenting. Uh, it was really quite informative. Um, and uh, I mean, the videos were, were really quite well done and enjoyable to watch. Um, so this is the third in a series. We will hopefully be planning another one um, sometime in uh, June. Uh, and then we do have our annual supporter meeting, uh, which is scheduled for uh, September or October of this year. And again, we will have another presentation at that time. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Uh, I counted about 177 attendees and um, I did find it very interesting that all 177 stayed right to the end, which is a testament to how interested they were in your talk, Matt. And this was a fantastic presentation. So thank you for participating. Once again, thank you to uh, uh, Allergan and AbbVie Company uh, for their uh, educational grant for, this, uh, for us to host this meeting tonight. And again, we'd like to thank all our supporters because without your uh, support, we cannot fund glaucoma research in Canada. And as Dr. Schlenker said, your money has gone to support him. And he was able to publish in an international uh, uh, ophthalmological uh, publication, uh, some very important data that helps us in the management of glaucoma. So, I mean, your funds do go a long way and are very um, beneficial to our glaucoma researchers across the country. So keep, uh, keep the support coming. And uh, again, this is World Glaucoma Week. Um, hopefully one day we can find a cure for glaucoma. So uh, please participate in local um, arrangements to uh, increase the awareness of glaucoma. And uh, thank you very much for uh, attending this evening. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Good night, everybody.